It's USDA's AgriLite insurance program right for you. This hour-long webinar is presented by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT, which is a nonprofit organization with offices across the United States. NCAT works in the areas of sustainable energy, sustainable communities, and sustainable agriculture. My name is Jeff Berkby. I am Outreach Director for one of NCAT's major programs, the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, which is also called ATRA. NCAT has managed ATRA for more than 20 years with funding provided by the United States Department of Agriculture. We provide extensive information on how to farm more sustainably, including information on crops, livestock, organic certification, farm energy, and many other agriculture topics. You can visit our ATRA website at atra.ncat.org. Now, today's webinar covers a new software tool for farmers that helps assess the usefulness of a federally subsidized whole farm insurance program, which is called Adjusted Gross Revenue Lite, or AGR Lite for short. The user-friendly software tool makes it easier to understand a relatively new kind of insurance that protects the revenue of the farm rather than the specific commodities produced on the farm. It's especially useful for organic farmers and other small farmers with unique or diversified crops that aren't normally uh, taken care of in commodity farming. The software tool is a culmination of a three-year project sponsored, supported by the United States Department of Agriculture's Risk Management Agency, or RMA. NCAT is grateful to RMA for their financial support for the development of this software tool and for their support for this webinar. Um, a couple of housekeeping uh, issues before we get started with today's webinar on ensuring, ensuring diversified and specialty farms. During this hour log, log webinar, you'll see a, uh, a box on your screen that says questions where you can type in a question during the webinar. Um, we'll see these questions and we'll sort through them during the lecture and presentation. And then we'll have a short question and answer session with our presenter at the end of the webinar. It'll probably go about 10 or 15 minutes with question and answers after the uh, presentation. We're hoping to be joined by uh, an RMA um, specialist from USDA during the questions to help with those questions, the uh, answer to those questions as well. One thing, if you miss anything during the webinar, keep in mind that the entire presentation will be archived on our ATRA website. Um, so you'll be uh, always be able to watch and listen to the webinar at a future date. We'll be repeating the website address several times during the webinar. It'll be on your screen so you can, you can see where to go for that. The presenter for today's webinar is Jeff Shazinski. Jeff is an agriculture economist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology in Butte, Montana. Jeff has a wide range of interests and expertise, including organic and sustainable agriculture marketing and economics, conservation policy, transgenics and agriculture, organic horticulture, farm energy economics, cooperative development, intercultural communications, and even beekeeping. Jeff has a graduate degree in agriculture, economics, and political science, two, two, two grad degrees, and also served in the Peace Corps in Belize and worked many summers on his grandfather's dairy farm in Wisconsin. He's been adjunct instructor at the University of Montana, Western Montana College, and Montana Tech, and serves on several nonprofit boards. Um, Jeff currently is a council member for the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. With that, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you to kick off the webinar. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, thank you for all for uh, being here this morning and to discuss this kind of unique insurance. Um, this this uh, product, uh, Adjusted Gross Revenue Light and Adjusted Gross Revenue generally, has been available for a number of years, um, and we'll, I'll discuss that more later. It, However, it hasn't been used very much, and part of the reason that it hasn't been used, and one of the basic uh, reasons we undertook this project was is that it's a bit complicated and it's fundamentally different. And um, as Jeff said in the introduction, it's, um, it's a whole farm revenue-based insurance. So you're not insuring a crop, a specific crop, or a specific livestock. You're, in fact, um, insuring the whole farm's revenue. So it's kind of insurance for your income or your revenue. And as we know and, and as we'll see, that, that's important for farmers. It's not advanced. I'm sorry, I can't get the thing to advance with the Okay, I'll have to use the mouse. All right. 
Um, and again, as Jeff said, we number of people. Well, RMA is sponsoring this, and as well as the as well as NCAT and the, uh, the our National Sustainable Ag Information Service. And this is a just a good quick shot of our cover page. So if you're interested in getting the tool that I'm going to be to demonstrating today and discussing, uh, you know, you, you can contact us through our hotline. You can contact us through emailing us. There's one thing I want to point out, though. You cannot download the software directly from the internet. Uh, you have to have to actually get a CD version of it and load and, and load the software onto your computer. The other thing I want to just make sure everybody knows, um, the tool is not um, uh, compatible with Mac, with Macintosh. It uh, works on a, um, um, a Windows-based system, and it was more di was difficult enough creating that one, and then it was to actually make it available on machines. I'm sorry for that, but that's just the way it is. So if you're going to use it, you're going to need a Windows-based, not a Mac machine. The, the other thing that's important to note, and uh, I hope you don't all leave <laughs> when you see this map if you're not in these states, but the states that are in green are where this product is available. The product is not available nationwide yet. Uh, we can maybe discuss, you can ask questions as to why that's so. There's a number of reasons it's difficult to create this uh, insurance. You have to do a lot of uh, actuarial data work to understand the different risks and different, um, of different farms in different areas. That's part of the issue. Um, but this is where it's available now, and it may be more available in other places. You also know that there's certain counties. Many of those counties, um, like their sub counties, tend to be around uh, uh, metropolitan areas, and and it's just that there are no farms there, hence it's not available in a metropolitan area. So insurance in general, why do farmers and why 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 is in the United States actually uh, us as taxpayers subsidizing all crop insurance, including AGR light? Is, uh, is subsidized, so we're, uh, roughly around 50% of the cost of the premium is subsidized by taxpayers. And, and of course, this is a dahe, farming is risky. Um, and in fact, one could argue that much of the motivation for the subsidization of agriculture generally is, is that, in fact, it is so risky. So insurance is one of those things we, we, we assist farmers with. And this graph kind of helps you to understand why. I know it's a bit dated, but um, it, it basically gives, makes the point. If you look at the green line, which is just net farm income up from all farms across the country, you can see over the years the variability in, air, in, um, in income. And, and basically on this axis you have something called the statistical, called the coefficient of variation, which is really just the percent change from the previous year kind of thing. Uh, it's actually a little bit more complicated, but it really just ch changes from the year to year changes in net farm income from households. So as you can see from this graph, you have you know, it going up and down over the years. And, and if we went forward, I'm pretty certain it would be the same. And the other two lines are kind of interesting. First, the blue line is all, farm, all US households. And you notice that there is not very little variation in the income uh, of us as people that are employed. And, and if you think about it, why that's so is that most of us, hopefully, and not all of us, maybe more of us need to be are employed. When we're employed, we have the relatively fixed salary. Our our income doesn't vary. You know, it might go up, but it doesn't vary one year to the next significantly, or go up that much <laughs> that much significantly. If you, again, if you're averaging it across all households, so the variation in in in, in income or revenue is, is quite little for average person. But you can also see if you put on there with the yellow, which is all farm income from households. Um, which is, uh, you know, which is one way in which farmers try to uh, help with risk is to is to work off farm, either that being the spouse or the farmer themselves or both. In many cases, we know this has been happening over the years that uh, farmers having a hard time making it on just the income of the farm have to go out, out. And in part, what that does, as you can see from the graph, it lowers the variation. So one way to again limit the variation in income from farming is to go off farm and get an income from, from one that's more stable. And then if you take and add them together, you can see that, again, you know, one way, again, to, to limit risk and variation is simply to get an income off farm. But ideally, it would be nice, if, and I think many farmers would agree, it would be nice if they could, could get their entire income from the farm rather than have to, run, to work two, three, four jobs to maintain a steady income over time. 
Also, as I, was, I said, it's an important subsidization of agriculture. This uh, is a prediction, so they're not, you know, they're, they're pretty good predictions from a good university that I used to go to. So, I, um, of course, they are predictions, and it's very hard to predict the future costs. But this is just a, a simple uh, um, chart that shows the um, expected net outlays, and these are from Congressional Budget Office uh, of what they would call mandatory funding, m funding that's already been authorized to be spent. And you can see the commodity programs um, are expected over the next 10 years to cost something like $63 billion of taxpayer dollars. Crop insurance, however, is 76. And you can see conservation programs, which is large. And of course, you can see that, uh, which in, is included in the uh, farm policy, is the SNAP, which is really f uh, food stamps. That's a, a huge expense for, for, the, for us and the nation, and child nutrition programs. But you can see, you know, conservation programs. But what's really interesting in the next few years, and what has changed from the past, is that crop insurance is, in fact, um, you know, a, a significant subsidization is going on. So I think it's very critical for us to look at the ways in which you know, we use insurance and do insurance. And I, I'm really a strong proponent, obviously, of whole farm-based um, insurance. So again. AGR light is whole farm revenue based. I've made this point, but it's very critical to, to make this distinction. Uh, it gets confusing. If you think about crop insurance, you usually have people mo no, mo normally think, I have a corn crop, and I'm going to insure that corn crop. And I usually base that on some historical records of my production, and then you, you pay a price. And it's basically subsidizing either the, the price of that, there's a, there's crop revenue, so I could have corn revenue insurance for that specific corn crop, or I could have corn price insurance, essentially. I mean, I'm, I'm weather insurance, anything that would affect my yield or yield insurance. So you have that. Those are the two, those are the ones that are most common. Those are the ones that are most used. Those are the ones that, um, in fact, are out there. In fact, there's so many because there's so many different crops covered. Although most of them are in the major commodity groups, there are some increasingly specialty um, crop-based crop insurances that are both, and there are some more of the revenue. And there is, in fact, even some livestock. Um, and there's not as many livestock ones. Uh, there's a few livestock programs now that are specific to, to livestock. But again, this is, again, not the specific crop for livestock. It ensures the revenue of the farm based on some historical data. So it hasn't been used. And part of this project was to create this tool, which I will demonstrate which we, was actually designed by farmers, was tested by farmers, extensively tested by farmers. Uh, it went through a whole software development process with Montana Tech and their software department here. And some students actually helped on it. It was a great project to create this tool. Uh, and it was a great, great experience in both software development and how to make products user friendly for farmers. So we've done some evaluations of, of the tool itself just in terms of usability. And we did a great job. We have getting really good positive. People really feel they can use the tool well. So it's not a really complicated tool. And it, it makes it very easy to understand what this insurance is about. It also calculates, it makes an estimate of what your premium would be if you were to get it. And it actually lets you do some what we call loss scenarios to explore the usefulness on your farm. But it's still not being that used. Um, one of the reasons we suspect that tax data is sensitive, or feel, people feel that it's more sensitive than just production data. And you do have to uh, provide tax data to be able to apply for the program. And taxes can get confusing because people you know, do different kinds of tax. They form their corporation in a different way other than just a simple business. That can cause some complication. Uh, buying the product is more, you know, it, it's more complicated and time consuming um, to you know to get the product because and this goes back to insurance agents insurance agents it's kind of a catch-22 because insurance agents haven't had to write many policies they don't really exactly know how to you know they there's probably some that have never written an AGR light policy and so that's a learning thing and you know insurance agents are in business to sell insurance policies if they're very used to selling crop based or revenue based crop revenue based insurance policies they know how to do that quickly, and they and they figured out methods of doing that. Whereas AGR is relatively new, and they, you know, people just don't want to change, and neither does the insurance agent. In fact, uh, if you really do get serious about wanting to buy this and go to your agent, you have to buy this through um, a, a private agent, uh, 
as you know or should know that crop insurance, even though it's federally subsidized, is sold only through private insurers. So we have it's a public-private cooperative uh, uh, project. So you know you can go in and, and get it, and it might they might <laughs> might steer you away from AGR Light more, I think, sometimes because they're just a little bit fearful of having to write the policy up because it's, they don't know it. But actually, we provide reports with this tool that will make it he uh, helpful when you go to your insurance agent to, in fact, um, do this policy. The other one, the big one, which we will see when we demonstrate, is that the premium may be too high for the loss coverage. In a sense, one way to think of this is that it effectively covers only 72%. You know, it insures up to 72% of your historical average revenue, gross revenue, and it's gross revenue, not net. It's not in net income insurance. This is gross revenue insurance. So, you know, so is that enough? You know, if the level of insurance was really effectively more like 80 or 90, I, I would think that people would be more interested. But then again, taken from the other side, if you have a loss to sustain a loss that's greater than, you know, 72% in, in, on a somewhat regular basis, it's better than losing the whole farm to have this insurance. And, and hopefully, even with a 30% loss from kind of an historical average, the farm can continue and it will be sufficient to basically protect one from from wipeouts and even a little bit better. And it's hard to say precisely whether this is kind of gives you that cost to value until you really analyze it for your farm because your farm could be unique in terms of both the crops it grows and the kinds of crops it grows and the number of crops it grows and the livestock. Again, this does include livestock so because it's anything that generates revenue for the farm. Uh, the other issue is diversity is often a form of insurance. And what I mean by that is this, uh, again, because it is insuring revenue, a farm could have, let's say, 20 different crops, four different animals. It's possible that there are not as many of those kinds of farms. But, but what happens when that happens? Usually that means that you have a lot of different sources of income coming from the different crops, coming from the different livestock enterprises. And essentially that diversity, if it's that extensive, is a form of insurance. And in some ways, it's kind of true, as we have seen with this program. If you have, and by using the tool and kind of trying it with different farms, if you're very, very diverse, like a market gardener with 80 different crops, and, and we've done this with those kinds of farms, and you know, and, and eggs and and meat and some other things, what happens is is that you know that you can't sustain a loss, or the, so, the loss is not pervasive across all those enterprises, and therefore. You pay a premium, but it's very rare. It would be a very rare case where all 80 and and uh, all of your livestock or or a significant amount of them crashed enough to kind of justify the cost. But again, it's hard to know that until you uh, on an individual basis until you work that through. But that's some of the issues going on. Um, many farmers simply don't know about it. The outreach and education. We're, we're in, in this project. I've been spending the last uh, four or five months going around the country giving talks on this, and this is just another one of our outreach education opportunities. So um, hopefully I'll be in your state and you come hear, hear this talk again, or you can just listen to this webinar. And the other one is it's not for beginning farmers, but of course this is really a criticism of all, uh, all insurance. You have to have some historical record upon which to base a premium. Um, so if you're only a first or second year of farming, you don't have uh, much of an experience in terms of growing specific crops or in, so you don't have a production history to, so to speak and you don't have certainly have a revenue history which you need to be able to individually calculate the risk and to get a premium so in this case you you need pretty extensive records that go really back to 2005 if you were going to buy the insurance in 2011 so again you have to have been in operation for a while to be able to use insurance but again this shouldn't isn't a criticism specific to AGR Light, this is kind of a generic problem of how to handle crop insurance for beginning farmers, which is which is a problem. But again, it's that whole issue of being able to assess risk. Also, uh, in the, one of our interests, because we do a lot of work with organic agriculture at uh, NCAT and ATRA and the, and the Sustainable Ag Information Service, um, and um, there's been uh, some complaints about it. <laughs> sometimes when I give these talks, organic growers get a little bit upset um, because they've been historically, essentially because there's been a historic lack of information about the risk associated with organic agriculture, um, there's been what they call a premium surcharge. 
Um, and and it's basically the reason for it is really quite simple in that that if you don't have good historical actuaries and in, in the way the estimate premium is based on some historical way to understand risk. And if you haven't been studying organic agriculture, which has been growing and have been watching prices and watching its riskiness, it's very hard to determine the riskiness of organic agriculture broadly. Now, some would argue it actually is less risky for a number of reasons in the way it practices, and that's hence the debate. But organic growers in general feel they're a little miffed because they end up having to pay a surcharge on premium. Now, RMA has been working over the number of years trying to fix that problem. And in fact, uh, as, as early as of uh, uh, August 30th, they did put out, uh, they are starting to eliminate the surcharge for a few specific crops. And the current crops that they're doing this on are some interesting ones, <laughs> figs. If you take fig insurance, uh, you don't have a surcharge. Florida citrus fruit, Florida fruit tree, which is only a pilot project in, fruit in Florida. Macadamia trees, which is probably largely in Hawaii nursery crops, which are a broad category of uh, nursery crops, are, are again, organic nurseries do not have to pay the 5% surcharge, pears, peppers, prunes, um, Texas citrus and Texas citrus fruit trees, and Texas trees, citrus trees. Um, and so there's, there has been some change, but, you know, that, this is a very small number of crops, and, you know, we have a whole wide range of crops. So, you know, it all depends on how long that happens. But again, you're going back then to the issue of just individual uh, insurance of very specific crops, correct? So and that's one thing. So that, so that surcharge is changing. The other thing that has changed, and that goes to the second point, that there's limited price, price selection. Uh, it actually should be election. I made a mistake. I'll have to change that. Uh, but price, um, price election is basically the idea when you, when you go in and you know, again, we'll go back to my corn, simple example, corn insurance, and I'm going to buy corn yield insurance or revenue insurance, I need to base that on some uh, future price of corn. And I can, and basically there's a price that is determined roughly in the broad commodity market, which is the basis of that number. And, and of course, in general, and not all the time, but, spe you know, or specifically for each crop, but in general, organic uh, prices are higher than conventional prices, which means that if I want to get organic corn insurance, I essentially can only cover it at the value of the conventional price, and therefore I'm not really fully covering the value of of the um, of that corn of that organic corn. And this is another thing. Now again, RMA is responding to that and has been trying to work through that, and they have now available uh, price elections for. Uh, organic cotton, organic corn, organic soybeans, and organic processing tomatoes. But again, only just for those, not for any other crops. So, and that that's helpful. That at least is then, for at least for those crops, allowing people to get a better level of coverage for their organic value. However, what's great about uh, uh, AGR Light, it already provides the, the solution both to the surcharge and to the price election issue, because it's the exception. Because again, it's based on revenue. So to the extent that you've been an organic farmer over the last five years, and to the extent that that price of organic crop has been reflected in your gross revenue, which it would be, then you are covering that revenue, which is your organic revenue, not just your convention. It's not a conventional revenue. And there's no surcharge if you're organic for using AGR Lite. So we have actually, with AGR Lite, in a sense, solved the problem of this without having to go the route of waiting for individual price elections or waiting for the RMA to actually um, reduce the surcharge or eliminate the surcharge on other crops. I think this is a very important point for the organic community. Oops, I went the wrong way. Okay. And I am, um, okay, and, uh, and again, I'm done with this and I'm gonna actually now shift to actually a demonstration of the tool itself, which I think is more exciting than my little PowerPoint here. And I gotta get make sure I can get to the right thing and I they've told me how to do it and hopefully this is just gonna show up. And there it is. So um, I'm just gonna make you take you through this and I'm not gonna read everything on the screen because you can basically get this at home, put it on your own computer, load it up, loads up very easy, very simple. 
um, and you'll be taken to this very first page, which is the very first page of the of the uh, assessment tool, like we call it, or we call it AGR Wizard was our is our cool name for it, the Wizard basically, and it, and it's a really cool tool in terms of really understanding AGR Lite, and it basically this is the first page of it. So you again you get it, you load it up, and you go in, and this is the first page, and it's just a general explanation page here. And there's more explanation about how the program works and the things you need. And, and, and it's kind of important to show up here. For instance, you can see your Schedule F. Um, you need your tax. And this is this is probably the hardest thing for folks that we've worked with and evaluated. Oh, I've got to dig out all my tax records. Yes, you do have to dig out your tax records to be able to do this. But again, for other insurance, you'd have to dig out all, all your production records and all your sales records. So. You know, it's not that un more unusual than it is for any other kind of ins crop insurance. Uh, and then you have to have some sense of your intended production for the coming year. And you need to make sure that you have good financial records because ultimately, you know, you have to justify the, the, the actual revenue you created and, you know, that basically that you can't be making things up on your tax form. So there could be some verification of that. The tool itself is really cool and it has a great help system with this blue thing. Um, that you can always hit, and I'll demonstrate that. So the first thing you need to do is determine your eligibility. And as I said, one main, main one, that, which you'll see, is that you um, got to be a farmer. That's an easy one. Yes. Um, is your adjusted gross revenue for 2011 likely to be over $2 million? Now that question is asked because, in general, AGR light, and that's the light part, is for relatively smaller farms, or at least farms that are below uh, on average $2 million um, of gross revenue. So if you're over that, there is another product that's whole farm based it's called adjusted gross revenue, which I believe goes up to more like a $6 million um, uh, total revenue. And, and, um, but unfortunately, that is even limited in, in, in its availability, but it's something to pursue if you're Larger and, st and like this whole farm con is your adjusted. So you have to say no because if you said yes, then AGR light you wouldn't be eligible. And citizenship, of course, is required for because it's a subsidized program. And here's where you can actually not even have to have the map because you simply put in your state and it'll ask for your county. In this case, I'm going to do a dem my demo is going to be based on some Kansas data I have and in the tool already loaded. So I'm going to pick Kansas is the state where my farm is located, and I'm going to pick the county of Brown. And I, if there's somebody on the phone from Brown County in Kansas, um, <laughs> I hope I hope you're interested in listening. But so it, and then you go next, and because nothing came up, I know for sure that that's not an issue. So I'm still eligible. And there's a few more questions. Have you scheduled apps for these years? Again, this is for the 2011 year crop year, which is still available. I think the Deadline for sign up for AGR Lite for the 2011 crop year is March 15th. If I said that wrong, some uh, actually uh, the RMA uh, Chris Mahona from RMA will might be on the answering questions will inform you of the exact date of uh, the deadline for this year's crops for this year's insurance. Um, and have you filed a Schedule F for those years? Again, you need this data. If you don't have Schedule Fs, if you're incorporated in a like in a corporation or an LLC and your tax forms are going to be different than a Schedule F. We set it up for Schedule F because that's by far the, the preponderant way in which farmers um, report their revenue, income from revenue uh, from the farm. And um, uh, then you have to work with an accountant to actually put it in the format of uh, a Schedule F. And we've actually had some people we've worked with who have done that. It's doable. It, it is more complicated and it takes a little more time. But again, we wrote it it would make it very more complicated to write the, the, the software if we had to put it for every possible conceivable way in which a farm could uh, organize itself tax, in a tax way um, in, in the United States. So we just went with the one that's preponderant. So yes, I have that. Do you expect more than half your 2011 production income to be from products purchased for resale? This is important because if your farm is really not that engaged in, in agriculture but really buying pumpkins from the neighbor and they're just selling them at your farm stand, and this is actually more than 50% of your income, these kinds of ac activities, which are fine, uh, this is really about insuring crops, not insuring, um, you know, 
added value things. It's not also insuring, um, you know, other businesses. And so you basically, it's a it's a minimum requirement that you have this 50% over. So I expect no. Otherwise, I wouldn't be eligible. The potato issue is a bit interesting. I'm going to say no, uh, yes, just to, to to give you the next question. And you, these combinations of questions, and then and you see the next question is, do you expect more than 83.3% of your production to come from potatoes? Um, the reason that's there is um, because the potato industry, when this when this insurance was recreated, was afraid that it would induce people to perhaps grow more potatoes or become only potato growers and use this product, which they um, basically don't want more potato production because we have an overproduction of potatoes as it is. So you would have to say no to be main eligible. So we're eligible, and now we're going to go to the next thing. And I'm actually going to I'm going to have to switch out of this and go back to um, entering a farm profile. Let me see if it's in there. Uh, no, I'm going to have to do it the way I always do it, which is to back out. Uh, and put up a, I'm going to start the thing back in a different way. So I need to restart AGR Lite, basically. And it'll take me a little bit of time with all this two different things going at the same time. Bear with us. We'll get to it really quickly. Just need to go back to AGR Lite Wizard and bring that up. And there you can see Marianne's uh, desktop, which I'm sure she really likes everyone to see. <laughs> and the reason I have to do this is because I basically, to, to demonstrate this, uh, preloaded information, it saves time. And so normally you would get this at home. You would go through the eligibility requirements. Once you knew you were eligible, you would never, whenever you went back to the program or went back to, you know, to play with it, you would never have to go through those steps again. You only have to go through those steps once. So because I'm loading this, I couldn't go backwards. I had to create a new farm, and I didn't want to do that. So I'm going to use this organic Kansas farm profile, and I'm going to load it. So you you can actually do this for multiple farms with this tool um, and in different years or ever, however you want to name your profile. And then you come back to that profile and load it. So I'm going to load the profile. And I'm going to start where we we would start, which is back here. So the first thing you do is gather your records for all the different years, and we're going to move, move on from there. So here we go. And now you just have your Schedule F in front of you. You have your 2005 Schedule F, which is the first tax year you have to enter some data in for. And in it, all you have to do, you don't, have, you, you don't have to think, and if you want to know why, we can try to discuss this later, why these are there and not there, but uh, why these things are there. But really, for simplicity, just go to line three of your Schedule F and put that number in there. If there's zero in there, put zero. And, and this is the most important one because this is basically your gross revenue is line four in your Schedule F is your sale of livestock, products, and grain. And that's the one that goes there. Now, we have this adjusted value because, we, because again, I was back to the idea that you, we're, this is insurance for the production of crops, not for the insurance of value-added businesses. So if I, and the easiest one is the apple and the applesauce. If I'm growing apples, AGR Lite could be part of the farm's, obviously, production. They produce apples. But that farm, let's say, takes those apples and makes them into applesauce. Well, this is not insurance for making applesauce. That's, in a sense, business insurance. So you have to separate out. If, if on line four of your Schedule F, you've encouraged sales of livestock, crudos, applesauce, you know, <laughs> just put the et cetera, but add the word applesauce, you have to take the revenue that was reported there out uh, related to applesauce production because applesauce is not what we're covering. We're covering the production of a crop or crops for the whole farm, not other businesses. And that can be kind of a pain, and that's another thing. But hopefully you don't have to do that adjustment, and you don't have to do it. These other things are just basically because, again, we're just checking these things are not really part of what is the production income and is really essentially what those are. But again, you can play with this at home. So we go and we do this for every year. Uh, again, taking each, t each one from our Schedule S from various copiers until we get done with all of them. And then we get to this final page, which gives you a nice, really cool summary of what your income has been over, your, your adjusted gross revenue, what your gross revenue has been over the last few years. It gives you the average. These are all important things for estimating your premium. We have a nice little chart that shows your average. And again, it's kind of like that first chart I showed you. You see the variability in the revenue of this individual farm in Kansas. 
and then we go next. And now we have to add, now we're going to talk about the intended year of production. And this is basically where you go commodity by commodity or product by product, and you put, it, put them into the thing and say what you're going to grow. And then we'll look at one of these just to give you a clearer sense of what you have done. So normally when I would go, I'm putting this for the first time, okay, so in 2011 I'm going to grow non-irrigated corn. And, and that's on the list. There's a whole list. And again, I'm not going to look. This is all in Brown County in Kansas. These are all the kinds of things that are highly expected to be grown in Brown County, Kansas. And so you pick the one that's the closest to what your crop is. And if you have vegetables that aren't on there, you can use the other vegetables. I will note, though, if you use other vegetables, it generally kicks you into a higher risk because you may be growing some very strange vegetable that there's no actuarial history on, and they're going to think growing other vegetables is a bit more risky, which will likely drive up your premium. But anyway, you know, I, so I did select this non-irrigated corn. So I, um, I'm going to keep it up there and say, and I, then I have to put in how much do I, acres do I plan to grow, what's my uh, quantity produced per bush, you know, expected output yield, and my expected price, and that's what my gross revenue is going to be from my corn. And in this case, I'm doing an organic farm just, just to show you that for the organic, and I and I can write in there separately that it's organic, and that's no problem. Okay. So that's how I've done it, and this farm has, interestingly, has a very small amount, but very pretty good revenue from growing three acres of direct marketed organic sweet corn. I also grow some uh, alfalfa uh, for sale and for use in the other cow-calf operation, so I also put some animal. Let's look at that one just to give you, so again, a cattle-cow-calf operation. This one is specifically an organic finished one. Uh, and he's got 40 head. He expects they're going to that he's going to sell in the crop year, the intended year, and that's 1,100 pounds average per animal. And he's getting a on the hoof price of $1.40, which is actually interesting. Left organic grass finished cattle growers in Montana have gotten that price for live animals off the farm. Uh, they haven't got that every year, but they have historically gotten that price. So there's another advantage of organic production: better prices, as we said. So again, this is reflected in the revenue. And I'm going to go next. Uh, so I've done that for all, all the crops on my farm, and this crop, this farm has four only. And we could add another commodity. I simply that, and it would make another line. We added more. Now we have a nice another summary of this. And it, now it's saying, it's coming up. What is your estimated adjusted gross revenue? And it usually picks the um, the lower of the two of your intended production, which in this year, let's look at the graph. It's a little easier. So in this. This is a little bit different than that previous graph because we have the intended crop here. And so basically this guy is saying, in 2011, um, I think I'm going to be not the best year I've ever had, but certainly not the worst year I've ever had. I think I'm going to be right there. And that's part of the calculation and the determination of what your gross revenue is going to be based in, your premium ultimately is going to be based on. So let's go next. Then there's multiple peril crop insurance. Essentially, you could have... AGR light, a whole farm-based insurance, and you could also insure a specific crop. Let's say, again, you had an organic field crop and you wanted to buy, uh, you know, conventional or, or crop-based insurance on that, and then you wanted for the rest of the farm, you wanted to buy a whole farm policy, you can do that. And this is where you would enter in the value of that individual policies, policy or policies, and it would become the primary source. So if the corn crop failed, then it would go to the MPCI insurance to pay off the, the indemnity or the loss. And then if it, but if the loss was due to something that happened to the whole farm revenue, and, you know, and, but it basically lowers the premium, but it kind of is essentially, a, you know, and lowers the payout because you're kind of going between two. It's very rare that people do that combination, but that is certainly a possibility, and here's where you adjust that for that. This is just an explanation. I'm not going to read this and spend much time on it because it really is a lot of language, but it's just a careful explanation exactly how all these different terms, loss payment, loss inception point, I think visually we'll see this at the end a bit better. The other thing is that because this person has, um, it depends on the number of things you grow. And again, this is insurance based on a more diverse farm, on a farm that's likely to have more than three different kinds of enterprises. Now you can buy this for two or only one commodity, 
uh, if that's all your farm grows, you kind of a monoculture farm that only grows corn continuously forever, you know, you could actually use this, but it'd probably be better to use corn insurance uh, revenue or price rather than this product because actually it will it will cause you to have a it will not give you these options if you if you only have one. In fact, until you get three, you don't get these this full lever, uh, options for coverage. And so for this farm, having an 80% coverage, which means 80% of that adjusted gross revenue is covered by insurance. However, once if you actually had that loss, you would only be paying the payment would be only based on 90%. And here's where I come up with that 70% effective coverage. Because if you multiply 80 by 90, you get 72%, which is really, in a sense, you're getting a 72% coverage of your adjusted gross revenue over time. And, and this is where the loss in Shepson point is essentially the point at which the farm revenue, if in the intended year, its revenue drops below 139787 you start to get coverage and payment to bump you up to that revenue. So that's basically where you're going to go. Again, with a graph, it's a little bit easier to see that. And again, this is giving a detailed explanation. And here's interesting, again, we were telling the 48% subsidy. This is what the... You know, this is the assumption that uh, apparently that if you bought this on a totally private market without any government subsidy, that's what it would cost you to get that level of coverage in the private market. This is what the government is, is taking off. This is what you pay, and there's a little administrative fee. So this essentially is the premium that's estimated. And again, this is an accurate premium. Everything there's a lot of stuff behind this, um, and everyone didn't need the help, but, but you can all help, and it can tell you all the policies, tell you all kinds of stuff about it. But really, this is. If the data going in is accurate, this will be an accurate premium. Now, you have to go to your insurance agent, and you have to go through it with them, and it might change because you might not have entered the information correctly, and they'll tell you why you didn't um, anyway. And it's telling you more. And here we get to the loss inception part. And this is where I think is most fun. And I'm going to just uh, load a saved scenario, which I call um, significant loss scenario. And you can play with this forever. You can play different what-if games with your personal farm while you're sitting at home on your computer. So you don't have to be bothered by your kids. If you're tired of that, you just go do this for fun. Anyway, and I'm going to lo load that. And I don't think it was loaded, so I must have not um, loaded it. Uh, significant loss. I'm going to load. OK. Oh, no. That's not good. I must have. Something didn't come up. Okay, doesn't matter. We'll play. We'll, we'll show you how to, how it works anyway. We'll do it. We'll do it on the fly here. So let's say, okay, I'm gonna say, oh no. Uh, so you predict that you're gonna have 85 bushels. Oh, but really I only have, um, let's say, 75 bushels. That was my real. And the crop, the organic corn, dropped to three dollars. Okay. So I go, okay. Oh, got a loss. And then organic sweet corn. Let's go there and see what happens. Uh, let's say, so I get uh, 60 bushel an acres from my great market thing. Had a bad corn earworm. I don't know what we had, some kind of problem. It really was only 40. And everybody else was into the organic sweet corn market. Dropped the price. Oh, darn. I had a loss over there. Okay. Um, my alfalfa, you know, non-irrigated. Um, you know, it just rained in come, whatever. I go down to two uh, tons rather than the, the three tons I predicted. And again, everybody's getting to the organic market, so price started to drop. I only got $100 a ton for my great organic alfalfa that I'm selling to organic dairy. Okay, another loss. And, uh, and, and let's do one more. Uh, my cattle didn't get up to the weight I thought they, on average, and so I'm down to 1,000 pounds. And boy, that was that was a price I thought I had locked in. But again, the guy I was selling to, best I can do is a you know a dollar, a pound, five weight. And holy cow, that actually that's interesting. A thousand pounds, dollar per pound. Okay, where did we have? Yeah, so we've had a significant loss. We had a significant loss across everything. And of course, you know all the farmers out there are saying, well, that's not going to happen, and it may not. Um, uh, how risky your farm is, it's kind of based on your historical experience with risk and where you're located. I don't know if that's an unreasonable risk or not, but you can sit there and play with these. And then 
we should be able to save that scenario. Um, I'm going to save it as significant loss and go OK. Now I think it should be saved and it should have been saved for this demonstration. Note a couple things here. 70% uh, of allowable expenses. Uh, in other words, you can't be like deliberately, you know, not putting much into farming um, and, and then just covering it up, you know, trying to make it up on insurance. They're going to kind of check to make sure you're, you've made a good faith effort to be a farmer and actually grow these things. And, and the market does affect you and weather does affect you. And that might be a point I want to make. Uh, if you ever have an insurable loss on any crop insurance or whole farm insurance, immediately report it to your insurance agent. Do not wait. That often this causes people a lot of trouble because they say, oh, well, that didn't really happen. And don't do that. You know, as soon as you know something that's, or even you suspect it's an insurable loss, go to your insurance agent and ask him, I think this happened. I think this is an insurable loss. Tell me. Do it right away. Don't wait. And here's the best graph, I think, for exploring this. So again, here you have the guy's real revenue. Then you have where he said he was going to be. And he went down to here. And here's also where you can really see. Um, that's where he thought he was going to be. Now he has loss. And he could have a loss and not re recover any indemnity payments until he hit that red line right there. Then that's, that's, the kind of, that's the loss inception point, as we say. And then once he goes below, he starts getting prayed. So in this case, with that significant level of loss, in fact, the, the, you know, he paid $5,000 premium. He had a loss payment of $7,000. So it was in this year, with this kinds of losses, it was a great, a great product to have. And it, again, did not, um, it got him back up to his average revenue. And then, of course, finally, there's these reports. And I'll just put up one that's kind of cool to see. Uh, these are all generated. You just print them out. Take these to your insurance agent. This actually, for instance, is in the format that the insurance agent is going to need already. This will make it much easier to work with your insurance. It will make them be a little less leery of wanting to write up an AGR light policy for you because they'll have the information readily available. And of course, they have to verify all this information as being correct before they write the policy up. And essentially, uh, we're done. I want to just conclude and say, you know, and again, you can get this thing, play with it with your farm, put your data in. Uh, it's pretty, you know, why we're interested is that this insurance promotes diversity rather than promotes monoculture because you don't need any benefits until you actually have multiple things. It also is kind of interesting. It really basically is saying, you know, we're going to help the farmer, you know, with the risk that they're faced with both markets and weather. And, and as a society, we're subsidizing this. But what we're subsidizing doesn't force them to choose what they want to grow. With this insurance, you grow whatever will maximize your revenue, not grow just because I can get insurance on it. You know, in other words, you don't grow, keep growing figs, in this case, organic figs, because because I have an organic fig policy, but rather say, well, maybe I should grow something else and that gives more revenue. And again, it, I think it's, it'll provide for greater incentive for, for innovation. It'll be a greater incentive for greater diversity across the farm, which I think is generally good and good for sustainability. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, we have some time for questions. And I don't know if Chris Mahalona from the Risk Management Agency is going to join us or not, but. Uh, I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff. Again, this is Jeff Berkby with NCAT also. And um, uh, as uh, Jeff mentioned, we do have some time to talk about a AGR Lite with some questions we've had from our listeners during the last uh, 45 minutes. Um, we're hoping to be joined by Chris Malona, who is a risk management specialist with the USDA Risk Management Agency in Spokane, Washington, for the past 13 years. Um, and We'll see if Chris was able to get on the audio and connect. And uh, Chris, are you there yet? Yes, I am. Excellent, wonderful. The technology does work sometime. Um, Chris, we had some questions. I'll, I'll put a couple to you first. Some of, some of the federal level questions. Uh, one question was, um, what's the likelihood of the AGR Light program being expanded to states where it is not yet available? And what's the process for? people that want to make that process move along, getting engaged in that? Well, first there's got to be a demand for it. And uh, usually if there's a group of particular producers or at the state level to submit that request to RMA, either to the regional office or to the administrator office in Washington, D.C., and then um, 
most of the program when it w was first put out, it was uh, done by specific entities. Uh, most of it was done by universities who collected the information. They got to do a pretty extensive uh, data collection on all the commodities and set up some um, expert panels to help rate the program. But like any other program, there are uh, funding limitations. And uh, these days, uh, with a, a new movement in the current Congress to minimize um, federal spending, that might be an issue, too. I Could I uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. You know, and that's a really good point that Chris makes about with the funding. And, um, and in fact, I just had come back from a, you know, I do policy work. And there is growing interest, though, however, in the whole farm revenue concept. Now, whether that gets actually translated into legislation, of course, is questionable. But the, the benefits I pointed out, the idea that rather than have a, a lot of different policies across a lot of different specialty and regular crops, we might be able to reduce costs by having simply a rather, and we'd have to simplify it, and probably the coverage would have to be a little higher, but we might be able to actually provide a better package, in a sense, a whole farm package, if we in fact had a whole farm revenue across the board and across the nation. I mean, that's, some people are promoting that right now. Actually, the Iowa Farm Bureau actually is looking into that as a possibility, but again, that's to be determined, and probably be the new Farm Bill 2012 before even that would be conceived as an, as an idea, but it might actually lower cost and provide better overall coverage for the impact of what farmers are, are faced against in terms of uh, market and weather risks. While we're talking about funding, another question we had was um, in terms of the overall funding pot available for the AGR Lite program, is, it, is there a first come first serve approach, state by state allocation, or is there if, if I'm a farmer trying to sign up for this program, do I need to be worried about the uh, it, yeah, amount it's of Yeah, it's not a sign-up uh, program, Jeff. It's a, it's a private right. insurance product. And, it, mm -hmm. and in the states where it's available, you go to your insurance agent and they sell you the product. There's no funding limitation. That's just inherent, and that's, as, as with all crop insurance, the subsidization is part of federal legislation and authorized mandatory funding available that will be there. It's, a, it's essentially an um, entitlement program. So you're not competing. You're, 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 if you're in that state, you, you know, it, the premium will be different, of course, in different states. You could take the same farm in one state and put it in another state, and the premium will be different because the ecology, the, the risks are different in different states. Um, but essentially, you can buy this insurance. It's just a private pro pro product out there. It's underwritten by the federal government, so should there be contestations and problems? Chris should know this. I'll let him speak to that too. You know, that when there's issues around it, he often gets embroiled in those. But, but basically, the idea is it's a private product available to everyone. Chris, any comments on that? Yeah, if I could add to that, as far as if, if I understand your question right about a federal limit, where this program is available in all the states and counties, it it is available there. There are really no limits because the, the, the way that it works is that um, RMA is under contract with private insurance companies, and they are the uh, folks that sell and service the policies, service meaning um, if there was a loss to do a, a payout claims and things like that. So um, an RMA really is a, the reinsurer in this case, and hmm. kind of like, uh, for example, uh, when Lloyd's of London reinsures some of the other insurance companies for whatever reason, that is sort of like the position that RMA is in. But as far as it, if the program is available in a state or county, there's no limit as to how many people can sign up for it. And we want more, right, Chris? <laughs> I mean, I've I'm, I'm a, I'm a been a strong proponent of it, actually, as I've been doing more and more. And we don't sell this insurance, so we're not getting any benefit. We're, we're a nonprofit. We're not in the insurance business. I always tell that when I start these talks. We're not here to sell it. We're here to make people understand its benefits and its, and its problems. Mm -hmm. what, what role have you seen the, the crop agents, the insurance agents themselves, playing in promoting AGR Light? And are there, not that we want to name names, but are there some examples of superstars or agents that are really going after this and really trying to make their farmers aware of this? And is that an important role you see in, in making the program be a success? 
Go ahead, Chris. Do you want to answer that? You probably know. Oh, more I can only speak for, for the Pacific Northwest region, and in our regional office covers um, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. And the AGR program has been uh, pretty successful in our region, um, as far as uh, different agents' knowledge and whatnot. I believe there are agents within our region that uh, do understand AGR and AGR light and are able to uh, um, be able to explain it to producers that might be interested. As far as the rest of the country, I can't really speak to that. Yeah, I haven't looked into this um, just to add to that, uh, but I remember these are there's been several fun projects around AGR light funded by RMA and ours just is one of them. And um, th there was, th you know, there was a I remember this early on, um, and I, know I never actually followed the end of the project, but in Wisconsin, there were a few insurance, uh, crop insurance people who were thinking this is being a, a new area of business. They could specialize it, in fact, rather than, you know, a lot of insurance was, you know, are good at certain ones and better at other ones, and, and like all insurance agents, and, um, you know, it's kind of shop around thing a bit. And, um, you know, some of them were thinking of making this as a specialty because, you know, they, they would kind of have a new business and they would really learn how to, to work with people with this insurance. So, and I don't know if that, and that was Wisconsin was one of the areas where that was maybe happening. So maybe it's probably variable in different states. Really good. Mm -hmm. Jeff, in, in all the presentations you've been doing in the last year or so around the nation, are you, are you finding some good success stories of farmers that have tried to use this program and, and it's been, it has helped save their uh, operation after a disaster or is it too early to tell yet from this? Yeah, uh, it, yeah, I have a, a lot of, and in fact, we're going to document that and it'll be part of the final report of this project. Um, where, where it seems to work best is for people who have um, certainly more than three different kinds of crops or livestock that they produce. So they have to be in, in, I guess, three or four or five different enterprises, you know, livestock and crops aren't, um, you know, that's probably be more diverse than average across the country, you know. So it's, first of all, you have to be relatively diverse already. It makes more sense. It's a product for diversity. So if you're diverse, it fits you better. I mean, if you have a single crop, just go with a single crop rather than a diverse one. But if you're diverse and you're not too diverse, that's the other thing. If you're on the other end of being very, very diverse, then again, your insurance is your diversity. Often, it's not really doesn't pay out because no one enterprise will affect your overall gross revenue. If you're organic, this is a very good. Uh, and some of the organic growers we've had evaluations of are very interested in, in partly because of the surcharge of the premium and the issue of price selection. And many uh, organic growers grow some are first diversified and often grow some very unique crops. Uh, some, for instance, they grow some grass seeds that are, you know, organic grass seeds that have a very valuable market. So that if they have a significant, and it becomes a very important part of their you know, revenue over time. And if they have a significant loss on that on that very high valued crop, um, then you know it's a very good insurance for that, where that's a component of their of their broad revenue base. You know and Chris was saying in the Northwest, a lot of uh, orchardists use it, and and orchards why? Orchards have two big things that tend to make them risky: is they are susceptible to market fluctuations. There were some dramatic market fluctuations in the recent history in, in apples and and other fruits. And what else? Fruit is also very susceptible to to weather-related losses or yield losses, and often mm -hmm. those yield losses can last multiple years. So I think you know it's hard to say per se, you know, who it's going to be fixed for without, but now <laughs> you have this great tool, you can sit at home and you can figure it out for your unique farm. And, but I would say it's probably, that's why we titled the special, specialty and diverse. That's, you know, that's the folks that's going to hit. And I'm not sure what, I think agriculture is changing. I think there's more and more people that are becoming more diverse and there's certainly more people coming organic which is a kind of a specialty um, and therefore I think it has a, a good future. Um, again I think the other thing is that coverage level, that cost of value, it's hard to say but I think it would be nicer if it actually had a little bit higher coverage, more like an effective 80 percent coverage of your gross revenue I think would make it more attractive to folks. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Chris, we're about ready to wrap up here. I think I'll give you a final a question, then ask Jeff if he has anything to wrap up with. But um, Chris, from your perspective at the federal level, um, do you see any changes coming down the road in AGR Lite additions or more promotions, or what, what's the future hold from your perspective for the AGR Lite insurance program? Well, I'd like to address the other other topic that Jeff was talking about just before this. Sure. And um, the part of the intent of uh, AGR program Whole Farm was to provide a program for specialty commodities. Um, RMA has uh, many programs for some of the bigger crops around, but for some of the different smaller, unique uh, specialty commodity farms, there was never a program available. And AGR Light uh, provides that right now. So where it is available, pretty much you can ensure anything that you're growing on your farm at this point. The other, some of the other benefits of AGR Light is that you can cover um, if you're growing a specialty commodity, say like uh, I don't know some organic form of a, a particular commodity. You can capture a, a higher expected value with AGR Lite, whereas uh, with the other more traditional multi peril programs RMA has, you're you're limited to a price election. So um, now the the second question that you asked was about um, the the future of AGR and AGR Lite. Uh, there may be an, uh, a situation down the road where both of the programs are combined. At this point in time, that's <clears throat> that's not uh, a high priority for the for the um, agency. And uh, again, due to all the funding limitations and and how well the program is working across the country, um, we 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 hope that'll happen one day. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Jeff, any. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll end. Uh, thanks. Uh, to clear, I think if you didn't hear that, what Chris was saying is that, remember I mentioned there's an adjusted gross revenue insurance with the higher coverage of up to you know, $6 million. Uh, that number is right, Chris. But the point is, is that they're going to combine that program, which is even more limited in scope, with AGR Life. And it, and it would make sense because you know it's basically the same product, uh, just different categories of people that can apply for it. And they're, for again, Broaden, broaden this opportunity, and of course, broaden this opportunity in other states. Uh, you know, I'm, I really think, like for instance, I, I, I'm not, maybe on the phone from California wants to take on that task. I think this would really work well, for instance, in the state of California, just because of the nature of the specialty and diversified crops that are there. Um, it would be, I, I think, it would be a big boon for AGR and AGR Light if it wasn't available in, in California, for instance. That would um, be a very attractive state, I think, because of the nature of agriculture there. But it's changing everywhere, so it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. And I will end. Um, um, thanks. Uh, thank again, everyone, for who is here, and hope you're listening to this um, later, even if you have to get it later. I am going around the country. Uh, feel free to contact me any time about this. Uh, you can do that through the 1-800 number. They'll get, get me to you. Uh, and, um, and look for me. I'm going to Oregon. New Mexico and Wisconsin in the next month um, on the road um, doing some outreach on this project. So look for me there as well. And thanks, Jim. And thank you, thank Chris you. and, and uh, Jeff both. And one reminder to our listeners that on the screen right now you'll see that uh, middle address for the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, or ATRA. And this webinar will be archived on the ATRA website within a day or so. And you can listen to the entire webinar and watch it online at your at your leisure. Also, if you have questions that didn't get answered during the session, you'll see on that middle uh, panel there on your screen too the 800 number for the ATRA hotline. And if you have more technical questions about AGR Lite or anything else related to sustainable agriculture, feel free to call that number at any time, and we'll take in your question. And probably Jeff himself will get back to you, or he'll talk to Chris, and they'll give you some personal responses to your AGR Lite questions. On behalf of the National Center for Appropriate Technology, thank you for listening to this webinar and join us again for future webinars down the road. Thank you all. Goodbye.